welcome, this is Amanda Rockinson ZapQ and in this tutorial we're going to focus on statistical power. We're going to talk about the definition for statistical power, factors that influence it. We're going to talk a little bit about calculating it and also interpreting it. So what exactly is power? Well, it's a number or percentage that indicates the probability that a study will obtain a statistically significant result. More specifically, it's the probability that the study will support the research hypothesis if the research hypothesis is true and therefore lead to the rejection of the null hypothesis. In other words, it's the probability that your results will be statistically significant when they're supposed to be. Um, oftentimes what we see is that power is denoted um, here as 1 minus beta, where beta is equal to the risk of the type 2 error. Now, I said that power can be a number or a percentage. Let's talk a little bit about this and look at an example of it. A power of, let's say, 40% or 0.4 would indicate that a uh, if a study was conducted 10 times, it's likely to produce results, that is statistically significant results, four times. We'll learn in a little bit that this is a really low power and not desirable, but like I said, we'll get into that in a little bit. Now, statistical power can be influenced by a number of factors. Probably most significant is sample size. And what Stevens in 1996 says is that the power um, is not an issue with a large sample size, that is over 100. As you increase sample size, you increase power. The second most significant factor that influences power is the effect size. And as the effect size increases or gets higher, then your power gets higher. Power can also be affected by the alpha level or the significance level. Uh, it can be affected by the test direction. A one-tailed test may have stronger power than a two-tailed test, and it can also be influenced by the type of hypothesis test used. Um, this is the different types of hypotheses test increase power in different situations, but that's not necessarily something I'm going to get into here. What I really want you to note is there are two things that significantly affect power and that often the researcher manipulates or tries to manipulate um, or takes into consideration when influencing power, and that's sample size and effect size. Let's stop for a moment and make sure we understand how each of the factors we just went over influences statistical power by looking at some questions that Warner 2013 poses. Let's start with effect size. As our effect size increases, as it gets larger, assuming that all other factors in our analysis remain the same, what happens to our statistical power? Well, it increases. If you remember, if you go back to the previous slide, remember, as the effect size increases, so does the statistical power. How about the sample size? As the sample size increases, assuming that all other terms remain the same in our, our analysis, what happens to statistical power? Same thing as it happens with effect size, it increases. And remember, Stevens 1996 even said with a sample size of around 100, a large sample size, that statistical power shouldn't be an issue. I often like to say a large sample size covers over a multitude of statistical sins. It really helps um, with not only statistical power, but also making oftentimes the statistic more robust, which we'll talk about in other tutorials. But let's keep moving. Let's now look at alpha level. As an alpha level is made smaller, that is if we change an alpha from a 0.05 to a 0.01, what happens to our statistical power here? Hmm. Actually it decreases here. So as our statistical power gets higher, or gets lower, our statistical, our, so let me say that again, because I don't want to mess this up. I want to make sure we understand it. As our statistical power get, as our alpha level gets higher, our statistical power gets higher. As our alpha level gets lower, our statistical power gets lower. Okay, one final question. If we know ahead of time that our effect size is going to be very, very small, so we looked at other research studies and we found out the effect size expected for our study is going to be small. 
what does that tell us about the N that we need in order to have an adequate statistical power? Well, we're going to take a look at answering this question in a moment. As our question just implied, statistical power is important to consider when planning your study. It's also important to consider when interpreting your results, but we'll get there. Let's talk about an a prior power analysis first. The power that we desire for a study is 0.8. That means that we can say with 80% certainty, so we want to be able to say with at least 80% certainty that our results are correct. Now, this is usually done by ensuring that the sample size is large enough to detect the expected effect. So the way that we increase power oftentimes is to have a sufficient N. Now, I will note as an aside here, you can increase or maximize statistical power in other ways than just increasing your sample size. For example, you can decrease your um, confidence level or increase your significance level. Uh, use all the information provided by the data. You can do a one-tailed uh, test, as we talked about a little bit earlier, as well as use parametric rather than non-parametric statistics. However, most commonly what we do to ensure that we have a sufficient power or the way that we increase power prior to a study is to increase the sample size. Now, there, what we should do prior to the study is calculate an a prior um, or calculate um, what sample size we need prior to conducting a study. And this can be done in a number of ways. Um, Cohen's 1988 book has charts. There's also open source and paid software such as GPower. We can even calculate power in SPSS. But here we're going to take a look at calculating it um, using a power table. If we have a given alpha, which is usually 0.05, and an estimated population effect size, which we usually can determine by looking at other similar studies, we can then identify, and we know that we want a power of 0.8, we can use a power table to look up what sample size we, we need. So let's take a look here. Um, what we see is is that if we want to conduct a t-test with a significance level set at 0 0.05 and a power of 0.8 and let's say that we can expect a moderate or medium effect size we need if we're doing a group comparison study we need at least 64 individuals per group or 128 individuals overall in order to ensure a power of 0.8 now where these numbers from in this power table come from um, is beyond this tutorial, but Warner and Cohen both have great discussions on this. So I encourage you to read them um, to so you can better understand this idea of where these numbers come from. But here what I really want you to note is, is that prior to conducting a research study, it's important to plan to have a power of 0.8 and you do this by making sure that you have a large enough sample size. And again, the sample size, the sample size needed can be looked up using power tables or charts um, in books such as Cohen 1988. Now I recognize that research texts suggest much smaller sample sizes. And this is because there are research conventions for sample sizes and statistical conventions for sample sizes. And if you want a strong study, you need to consider power and st consider the statistical convention. Let's take a look at this a little bit closer. For an experimental study in which two groups are compared, Gall and his team in 2003 suggest that a minimum sample size of 15 is used. However, if we go to Cohen's power tables and look this up, what we find is, is this suggested sample size will only render a power of 0.38. And that's just for a one-tailed t-test. Let's say that um, we want to conduct an experimental study 
and we um, are planning to have a moderate effect size. We want to detect a moderate effect size for a one-tail test and we've set our alpha at 0 0.05. What we find is is really the more desirable um, sample size is about 51. So it's just important and there's multiple examples of this um, and I'm not going to go into great detail here but it's just important to remember that there are research conventions but there are also statistical conventions and you really need to identify the sample size you need based on power and remember you're all you're always aiming for a power of 0.8 okay so based on what we just talked about and calculating power based on effect size and sample size let's go back to the final question that we were discussing from Warner the question was, if we know ahead of time that our effect size is going to be very small, what does this tell us about the n that we need in order to have adequate statistical power? That is, what does it tell, um, what do we know we need to do to have a power of 0.8 if we know we're going to have a small effect size? So think back to that table that I showed you a few slides ago. Well, if we know the effect size is small, what we know in order to ensure a power of 0.8 is that we're going to need a large n. In fact, we may even need an n up to um, 786 according to Cohen. What if we had the opposite um, question? If we know ahead of time that our effect size is going to be very large, what does that tell us about the n that we need in order to have adequate statistical power? Well, basically the opposite. If our effect size is large, then a or then our n might not need to be very large. In fact, we may only need about 52 participants in this case. So now we've talked about the role of power prior to conducting a study. Now let's focus our attention on power at the end of a study. After you've conducted a study and you've calculated your results, you should also calculate power for each statistical analysis. You need to calculate it, report it, and then discuss it, interpret it. Here's an example from a study that I did not too long ago and what you'll see is I got statistically significant results and my observed power here was strong at a 0.84 so what does that mean? That means a power of 84% or 0.84 indicates that if I was to conduct this study 10 times it would, like, it would be likely that I'd have the same statistically significant results at least 8 times and I can state that my results are correct with an 84% degree of certainty. So I'm, I'm fairly confident in these results. But let's say that my power wasn't 0.84, let's say it was 0.4. A power of 40% or 0.4, remember, would indicate that if the study was conducted 10 times that it's likely to only produce the same statistically significant result about four times and I can only say with 40% certainty that my results are correct. So um, 
I would I I would want to be very cautious in interpreting my results. In fact, if you ever have a power below a point eight, you need to be very cautious about interpreting your results. And you, as a researcher, need to inform your reader about the possibility that you may have a type two error because the power was low. So how do you calculate this power for your results? Well, fortunately, SPSS does this for us. Whenever you do any type of gen, um, general linear modeling, what you'll find is, is that if you click the options button, under display you'll always see observe power. So you can always calculate power using SPSS. And there's multiple ways to do this. This is just one way to do it. Also, again, Warner and Cohen talk about calculating statistical power and how um, their power, how the power charts are created. So I also want to refer you to them so that you have a good understanding of how you can calculate power by hand and how it is calculated in SPSS. But know that SPSS does calculate it for you and it's important to go ahead and report this power in every manuscript that you put together. And then I'll make one final note about power. To this point, we've really talked about parametric analyses. And for the most part, that's what most social sciences do is parametric analyses. However, sometimes you want to do a non-parametric test. Power is important not only for parametric, but also non-parametric. However, power is not quite as straightforward and is um, often calculated using what's called a Monte Carlo simulation method. So if you want to, if you are doing a non-parametric analysis of some sort, you do need to consider power and do more research in that area so you know how to plan to have a sufficient power for a non-parametric analysis. This now concludes our tutorial on power. At this point, you should be able to explain what power is, talk about the factors that influence it, and what you should consider prior to conducting your study. And then also, you should be able to calculate power, even if it's just using SPSS, and interpret power um, in, your re in, a res in your results section of any manuscript or dissertation or report that you write.